Hello, my name is Richard Emerson, and today I'll be co-presenting with my colleague, Allison Wyckoff, our Black Hat 2021 presentation, The Kitten That Charmed Me, The Nine Lives of a Nation State Attacker. We are both researchers with IBM Security X-Force Threat Intelligence, and we appreciate your time today as we talk about an Iranian nation state threat actor we track as ITG-18. Before we get into the presentation, just a little bit about our backgrounds. I have a little over a decade of experience working in cybersecurity and intelligence analysis, with the past three years spent with IBM Security X-Force largely tracking Iranian nation state threat actors. Before that, I was working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory helping protect their network on the threat assessment team. And I also spent a few years working at the Department of Defense focused on cybersecurity issues. And I'll let Allison introduce herself. Hi, I'm Allison Wyckoff. I've been with X-Force for about a year and a half, but I've been in the field for 20 years working in research, intelligence, network defense, and incident response. I spent the latter half of my career researching nation state cyber threats with an emphasis on threats stemming from Iran. I've also been an incident responder uh, and threat intelligence analyst for the Federal Reserve System and held various network defense positions uh, at Citigroup as well as Mayo Clinic. And finally, in my copious amounts of spare time, I guest lecture at Columbia University. For our presentation today, we'll be talking about the Iranian threat actor we track as IBM Threat Group 18, aka ITG-18, which overlaps heavily with the threat actor reported in open source as Charming Kitten and Phosphorus. We plan to discuss how this threat actor typically operates, what tools we've observed, including the Android remote access tool that we dub Little Looter. We will touch on some insights we've gleaned from the mistakes this group has made, and then show two training videos one ITG-18 operator produced. Like anybody else, the operators that comprise ITG-18 are not perfect, and we can learn aspects of their operations from their mistakes that hint at their size, as well as how they may be raising the next litter of operators. You can find links to this research that provide additional detail at the bottom of this slide. I want to state up front that this is not a talk focused on attribution. We will define what we consider ITG-18 with the understanding that other organizations with different vantage points and data may track the operators behind this activity differently, and that's okay. I also want to note that for victims that we were able to identify, we did attempt responsible disclosure by contacting and sharing that information with the appropriate law enforcement agencies, as well as masking identifying information within the presentation. So with that, let's get started. So our story begins like those of many others in the cybersecurity industry with some routine pivoting to identify adversary infrastructure. So for us, it was May 2020, and we were following news reports of our threat actor, ITG-18, targeting the US biopharmaceutical company, Gilead Sciences. At this time, which seems like ages ago, Iran was in the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic, and so they were likely interested in gaining access to any information they could on potential COVID-19 vaccines or treatments. We also knew that for ITG-18, while this targeting may have seemed atypical, that it was not uncommon for the threat actor to pivot to focus on short-term, higher priority objectives. In anticipation of publishing on this activity, we started to double check the infrastructure we had already associated with this group when we came across an open directory. Over the course of one week, we saw several files uploaded to the server, including exfiltrated information related to a Greek Navy member and a US Navy member. With that exfiltrated information were four plus hours of desktop recordings of an ITG-18 operator manually validating victim credentials, as well as several shorter video files, which we later determined were training videos. Now, as we will see through our presentation, it was not uncommon for this group to leave open directories on their servers, particularly when it came to information ex exfiltrated from their victims. But what we hadn't seen were recordings made by the threat actors themselves sifting through exfiltrated credentials and creating training videos ostensibly for others to follow to do similar work in the future. So to say that Allison and I were excited would be an understatement. The video certainly added details to our understanding um, of this group that we didn't have previously, but we've been tracking their operations for some time and we already had a good sense of how we defined this group. So for us, a hallmark of their operations was phishing against personal social media and webmail accounts to support their espionage and surveillance objectives. They likely target a user's professional accounts as well at times, but between the subdomains we've observed on their phishing domains, as well as the phishing landing pages, there is a consistent focus on collecting credentials from services like Gmail, Yahoo, Microsoft, etc. 
And while that is not completely out of the norm for a nation state threat actor, it is a more defining characteristic for this group than others that we are tracking. Something else that we took note of for this group even before the discovery of these videos were how far they would go to add a personal touch to their operations. So reportedly they have texted and emailed with victims to build a rapport before attempting to get the victim to download malware or visit a phishing page and have even gone so far as to offer to call their victims as reported in open source. What this hinted at was how much of a manual process some of these operations were, which is something we will touch on later in the presentation. Finally, this is a group that frequently leases their own servers, registers their own domains, and they've used pretty consistent patterns in doing so. They've also continued to use some of the same providers for years, like OVH and Hetzner for hosting. This isn't a group that is constantly innovating and trying to hide its activity from the security community. They have some tried and true methods of doing things, and regardless of public disclosure, it's continued to work for them in terms of compromising and exfiltrating data from their targets. And you can see this a lot in their phishing pages over the years, where they may host some first stage content on a legitimate platform like sites.google.com, leverage a URL shortening link on that page to redirect the victim to the final credential harvesting link that will mirror what the legitimate provider is using. And that's one of their standard playbooks. Not a lot of significant updates, not a lot of changes. And so you see very consistent phishing landing pages over the years as the operators continue to target the same kinds of accounts over and over again. As I mentioned, this group doesn't appear to change much even after public disclosure. One of the best examples of this was the court case Microsoft won in March 2019, where Microsoft was able to take over 99 domains associated with the group they track as Phosphorus, aka ITGA team. One of the domains that Microsoft sinkholed was identifier services sessions.info. And what was ITGA team's response to this activity? To register, an almost identical domain three weeks later to continue the same phishing activity. Microsoft has continued to sinkhole ITG18 domains, and ITG18 has continued to register new ones, leveraging some of the same providers in an ongoing cat and mouse game. This group does not seem to particularly care about public disclosure of their activities like other groups do, and possibly, be, possibly because they continue to enjoy success with their tactics. In terms of how this group is successful, aside from stealing credentials, there have also been a limited number of tools we've identified this group potentially using. The first is a legitimate pen testing tool abused by a lot of threat actors, Metasploit, which we've seen hosted on several of their servers since at least 2017. The second is a commercially available Android remote access tool called SpyNote, hosted on one of their servers in 2020. A SpyNote builder was leaked previously, and the version observed hosted on the ITG18 server, version 7, was allegedly available for download on several Iranian sites, potentially indicating where they may have gotten it from. Another Android rat observed on the same ITG18 server was a version of Andro rat, based on the GitHub project noted in the slide. And a custom Windows executable backdoor named PDF Reader, which was the name of the file. This is a tool that's believed to be only used by this threat actor. You can see to the right several aptly named modules that the backdoor can download to extend its functionality. The code for most of these modules are copied from open source projects, and very little is done to obfuscate anything in the code. The backdoor also generates a lot of noise in terms of writing files to disk, so this is not the most sophisticated tool. And finally, this brings us to another tool we discovered on one of their misconfigured servers, which we're calling Little Looter. This is a functionally rich backdoor that is capable of recording video, sound, phone calls, enumerating and configuring network information for the device, gathering information on call history and SMS messages, making phone calls or sending SMS messages, gathering location data and browser history, as well as sending error information to the C2 server. The malware is also capable of downloading and installing updates, and the version we saw was version 5, as noted in the code. Since the C2 domain was registered in the summer of 2020, we've seen multiple uploads of victim information to the XFIL folder on the C2 domain. And as of the recording of this presentation, this C2 domain is still live. This sample has since been uploaded to VirusTotal and is available for anyone to look at, and additional details about the tool can be found in the blog post noted at the bottom of the slide. But you can see how a backdoor with these capabilities would certainly aid ITG18 surveillance mission. With these phishing pages and with these tools, what we've come to know about this group over the years is that while they're not particularly sophisticated, they are still successful. 
by our estimates monitoring the directories they continue to leave open on some of their web servers, and by downloading and reviewing the information, this group has exfiltrated close to two terabytes of data from victims since the fall of 2018. And that's just what we are able to see. Additionally, not all this information was taken using the tools we previously discussed. ITG18 is adept at using some of the built-in legitimate tools of the accounts they compromise, including Google Takeout, which allows users to export data related to all of their Google accounts to include information from Android devices into a downloadable archive file. And this data is often very personal. As an example, for one compromised individual, the Google Takeout data included location information, so we were able to see this US person visiting US military bases, as well as potentially taking a vacation, such as when this person visited Disney's Epcot theme park, spending time at the test track, the Imagination Pavilion, as well as the Italian, German, Chinese, and Mexican pavilions, which you can see on the right of the slide. Also, that data included that person's queries to the Google Voice Assistant, so we were actually able to hear snippets of this person's voice as well. With all of this personal information taken from targets of interest, we can only guess at how it's been used by the Iranian government to further their objectives. Now, we've talked about some of the operational achievements for this group, but where have they slipped up? Well, we know about Little Looter and all this information they have exfiltrated because of persistent server misconfigurations. ITG18 routinely leaves open directories in some of their servers where they stage exfiltrated data and tools, presumably before it's downloaded somewhere else. Over time, after analyzing hundreds of their servers, we've identified some other possible mistakes they've made in the past, like possibly the one on this slide. Now, if you have a specific target you're going after, you usually want to keep that information secret so as not to tip off security researchers or the target itself. But then on this ITG18 created web page on the slide, the title was literally targets and the page included the target's phone number. It's not broadcasting it on social media for sure, but still maybe not best practice. For this second example, like any decent Iranian fisher, you might leverage the tool HTRAC. For those of you who don't know, HTRAC is a few free utility that allows you to download a website to a local directory by recursively grabbing all directories, HTML files, images to view the page offline. You can see how this may be a useful tool for an avid fisher to use and how it could help create phishing pages that look legitimate. But you generally don't want to run that tool against your C2 server and then leave the results of that scan on an open directory for anyone to download and analyze, revealing details about the backdoor and additional C2 servers which is what we see on this slide and is what ITG18 did. And finally, my personal favorite, it might not seem like a priority for the server that you're using to host your phishing pages to keep that software up to date and to configure it, that server to protect it from cyber threats. But then you may also experience a suspected globe imposter ransomware incident, like one ITG18 server did back in 2019. Ransomware is a big problem for a lot of organizations, ITG18 included. These mistakes are interesting and reminders that the operators on the other side of the screen are only human, just as prone to making errors and mistakes as we are. But what set apart the videos the ITG18 operators accidentally left on one of their servers for one week in May from mistakes we previously observed was how much more detail we were able to glean about how ITG18 operates. Combined with continued server misconfigurations this group has continued to make since this initial discovery, this has painted a more detailed picture of their operations that Allison will cover during the rest of the presentation. I just want everyone to marinate on that last point that Richard made. We saw a nation state operator's infrastructure get ransomware due to poor security controls. If that is not amusing, um, I don't know what is, and, and God, I love my job when things like this happen. All right, so back to the issue at hand. Richard and I have been working on the hypothesis that ITG18 is a pretty large operation for some time. And the discoveries that we've had over the last year have really amplified that. So I'm here to walk you through a couple of these factors in detail. In terms of our recent findings, We've repeatedly watched the four hours of videos they accidentally left on an open server, which addition to some training videos that we're going to show at the end of the presentation, also include the adversary exfiltrating information from accounts and validating all of the credentials that they've been able to steal. 
And we saw them log into these accounts manually and look for more details on the victim as well as downloading any additional metadata associated with the account. And what was really interesting to us was that there was no account that was too trivial for them to test credentials for. And we put a sample of those up on this slide, but you know, we saw diaper reward sites, food delivery sites, you name it. If they had a credential for it, they logged in and looked around. And a little aside about the manual credential validation, they also attempted CAPTCHA for accounts. And, and we all know how fun those are, right? And so to just humanize this adversary a little bit more, they struggled like the rest of us with some of these. So if we check out the traffic light on the left, there's a tiny little piece of it in another quadrant. Uh, and this hung them up for a bit. I think uh, Richard and I clocked it about 45 seconds. It took them to figure out that that's the box they needed to click to get through. Um, so we had uh, a nice chuckle at that, but it's, it's a great reminder that threat actors are humans too. The other thing that Richard and I um, have been hypothesizing is that the operators might be given their own VPS or virtual private server to perform operations soup to nuts possibly even getting a set list of targets. So specifically on some of the open servers we found, we have seen a combination of victim exfiltrated information and tools on the same server. So these two open servers on the screen that we're looking at uh, are associated with ITG18 operations we found in the fall. And the files circled in the pinkish purple magenta tint uh, are exfiltrated data from some of their victims. But then we're also seeing tools as well. And so the image on the left, we've got a valid copy of WhatsApp installer. And we're not sure if this was there uh, to install so ITG18 operators could communicate with each other or if it was potentially used to identify and lure new targets. Now in the image on the right, we've got more tools, uh, including a file called whatsapp.apk. That is the little looter malware that Richard covered earlier. Uh, we're also seeing a WinRAR folder that contains valid copies of WinRAR potentially used to unzip uh, the exfiltrated data from victims. Our theory that each operator may have their own box or target list was supported with the training videos that we're going to show you in a moment. Uh, specifically, we saw actors managing sets of compromised email accounts with sets of operator email accounts within the same tool. And again, we're gonna cover what we're seeing in this image when, in a little bit more detail when we watch the video shortly. To put it bluntly, we think this is a very large operation in terms of the humans behind it. Just the sheer amount of infrastructure that this group has created supports this theory on its own. So for example, we here at IBM have collected over 2,000 indicators associated with ITG18 uh, since 2018. This includes certificates, uh, phishing server, phishing domains, C2 servers. Um, we've also identified their intermediate VPN infrastructure, which at any given time has 20, 10 to 20 active VPN servers. We've also identified over two terabytes of victim exfil just since 2018. And again, this is just our research. Another supporting factor is that we have consistently seen this group pivot to various objectives that serve both long and short term uh, collection objectives. This pivoting would likely not be possible without a considerable amount of manpower behind it. For example, they've consistently targeted uh, Iranian journalists and researchers in country and abroad but they've also gone after foreign targets like COVID researchers, nuclear regulators, US politicians, and financial regulators, all depending on what's happening in country. Uh, we covered how the data and the credentials are stolen man and manually validated, which again is extremely time consuming. There is no way that scales with the amount of exfil this group has collected without a considerable amount of manpower behind them. And finally, uh, we found what we are pretty sure are training videos for new operators. So this would suggest that not only the group is large enough to need training videos, but also that they might have some turnover. Uh, so now it's time to get to the part of why I suspect uh, many folks are here listening to this talk, the training videos. 
Before we jump into the videos though, we wanted to give you a quick primer on, on what they are and what we're about to see. So these are desktop recordings made by the adversary with a tool called Bandicam. Bandicam is legitimate software. You can buy it. Uh, in the case of the ITG-18 operator running it, it doesn't look like they did. Um, ITG-18 created persona accounts on AOL, Yahoo, Gmail, and Hotmail. They logged into these accounts from known ITG-18 VPN infrastructure, which we saw while uh, we were watching the videos. And an example of what this looked like is, is here on the slide. All of these accounts were fakes, uh, confirmed fakes. The personas all had Western names, but when viewable, there were Iranian phone numbers associated with the accounts. Again, this is something we're going to see in the videos. Okay, so the videos are going to show the operators demoing setup, uh, demoing setting up a compromised account uh, for continuous monitoring using an email collaboration platform called Zimbra. Zimbra is also a legitimate tool. Um, and finally, the videos are going to show the operators demo demoing how to exfiltrate various types of information on their victims uh, through um, the various uh, webmail platforms. Um, last but not least, in order for us to be here um, and talk about these videos and show them. Um, we um, had one of our teams at IBM uh, blur out the victim and persona information for uh, this presentation today. All right, so let's, uh, let's get started. So what we're gonna start with now is the Gmail training video. And so what everyone should be seeing now is a dark desktop with Bandicam open. And this is how all of these videos start with launching Bandicam, the desktop, desktop recording software. What they're gonna do is they're gonna open Chrome and they're gonna browse over to Gmail. And we saw this pretty frequently throughout the, um, the victim uh, videos as well, where the operator had a notepad file open with all of the credentials that had been taken in um, an easy format for them to copy and paste. So what they're going to do here is they're going to copy and paste the credentials into Gmail and we'll see them do the same thing with Yahoo. But this is just a list of the persona accounts that they created for the various training videos. So right now they're going to copy the username, paste it, and they'll go back to the notepad file and copy the password. Again, very manual process. No MFA on these accounts. All right, so now we're in the mailbox. Um, you're seeing that a lot of uh, the emails are blurred out. Uh, what we saw with uh, the persona accounts was that a lot of them had signed up for mailing lists and Richard and I couldn't see a rhyme or reason to the particular mailing list. We think they did this to make the accounts appear active and more legitimate so they could fly under the radar of the various webmail providers. So at this point, they're going to browse over to settings of the Gmail account and modify the account so they can incorporate the account into Zimbra, the email collaboration platform. So what they're doing now is they're just scrolling down to the part of the account to change those particular settings, which are literally less secure access is the name of the setting. And you flag that on, which they're going to do. All right, that's been flagged on. And now they're gonna go back to the uh, mailbox and archive the alert that this setting has been made. I probably would delete it, uh, but that's just me. And then they're going to get an alert. Did you make the setting change? Yes, it was me. So now we're all set up. So at this point, this is Zimbra. They are going to add uh, the Gmail account into um, to Zimbra. And they're just going to copy and paste the email address as the account name, full name, et cetera. Much easier to manage that way. And then they'll copy the password in. And at this point, they're going to change the syncing from uh, every 15 minutes, the default to every minute. Naturally, you're going to want things in near real time. So we're going to see an authentication error here. Um, part of what we did um, when we were doing notifications uh, before we went public with the research was reach out to um, victims. 
what we found out in this particular case is one of the victims had already been notified that their account had been compromised and they changed the password. So the adversary was no longer able to authenticate into that account. So we'll see that authentication error a couple times in this training video and again uh, when we show the other. So there it is. Just going to dismiss that and move on. And at this point, we are going to uh, make sure that all of the um, folders in that Gmail account are syncing into Zimbra. Even the junk folder, you never know, there might be something fun in there. Trash as well. All right, now that that's syncing, the adversary is going to navigate to different aspects of the Gmail account, starting with Google Drive and download the information associated with it. So. Now, if this was a valid account, like yours or mine, we'd probably have more uh, files in here uh, and the download would take a little longer, but what you'll see is they select everything and download it. And again, those are just dummy files. This is one of my favorite parts. Watch the address bar and pause it real quick. They fat fingered the email or the URL for uh, contacts.google.com. Again, humans behind the, the keyboard, they'll fix it. It's frustrating, isn't it? Contacts.google.com. And again, this was just uh, you know test information added to the account for, we think for demo purposes, you and I would probably have more contacts associated and the downloads would take longer. Now we're going over to photos. Photos was interesting to us because we got uh, a timeline of how long this account may have been active. Again, um, nothing super exciting in here except the news that's followed and maybe their Marvel comic preference. But what we're gonna see as they scroll down is this account has been active since February of 2019. And we found this in May of 2020. So again, they're gonna select all the images, download them slowly. Uh, and again, if this was a, an, a victim account, it's going to take a lot longer to download. But you know, as Richard and I have watched these videos uh, numerous times, we still can't get over how quickly the adversary was able to navigate through these different accounts. What they're doing at this point is they're checking all of the um, various aspects of the Gmail account that they've downloaded to make sure that it was populated with information. So they check contacts, they just check drive, and they'll check photos. And then they will move over to Bandicam and stop the recording because the demo is done. So that was the Gmail uh, training video. At this point, we're gonna go over to Yahoo. And again, you'll notice that setting up the uh, Yahoo account for monitoring is a little bit different than Gmail. But one of the things, and I, I know I've said it, uh, but it just still blows both of our minds, is how quickly the adversary is able to get into these accounts and set them up for monitoring and exfiltration. It just speaks to how long uh, the actor's been doing this. So again, Bandicam starts, uh, we launch Chrome, and then we browse over to Yahoo. They're gonna go back to their notepad file, copy and paste uh, the credentials for their Yahoo persona account, and log in. And go back and get the password. There we go. Copy, paste. So again, with the Yahoo account, and we saw this with the other accounts as well, but there were some mailing lists that the adversaries subscribed to, we think again, to, get, um, to make the accounts look more legitimate. But the other thing that we saw in here that sort of speaks to what these accounts are also likely used for is bounce back messages. So. Again, we found these videos in May. We're seeing some bounce back messages from April uh, that indicate that some messages had been sent to folks. Now we, we've obviously blurred these out, um, but this is how Richard and I determined that there were people from the US State Department as well as an, an Iranian American philanthropist targeted. In one of the cases, the email um, address was fat fingered and that's why it bounced back. The others clearly weren't valid email addresses, but attempts were clearly made. All right, so at this point, um, they are going to modify the Yahoo account to incorporate into Zimbra, and we're gonna get to see uh, a couple more interesting data points as they navigate through the account information. So I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, and 
And what we've got here is a plus nine eight phone number associated with this account that again had Western names. So plus nine eight for folks who don't know is the Iran country code for phone numbers. So this was a really great data point uh, when we saw this. And we did see this with some of the other accounts. So here we are setting up uh, access to Zimbra. It's a little bit different uh, than it was for Gmail. So in Yahoo, you create a special application password. What they're doing here is they're gonna copy the username of the Yahoo account so they can paste it into Zimbra as they set up. So we're gonna add the new Yahoo account, paste this in. They actually fat finger the email address here. You'll see a little C hanging out from the blur, the backspace and then copy and paste and then go back to Yahoo, copy the password, paste it in, and then they're going to change the syncing from every 15 minutes to every minute again, so you can get those emails sooner rather than later. You'll see the authentication error we talked about earlier. And similar to Gmail, they're going to sync all of the folders of interest in this account. So inbox, and we'll see those bounce back messages there quickly. And at this point, they're going to go back to the Yahoo account and export the contacts. Now, in the case of the Yahoo account, they didn't add any test data to it. So there's nothing in the file. But we'll see them do it anyway. And again, double check, but there's nothing in there. And stop the video. So um, in and out in two to five minutes. Again, it would be a lot quicker if it were, uh, or a lot longer if it were um, a legitimate account, a victim account. Um, I'm sort of closing this up. So I hope it's clear that Richard and I have really enjoyed this research, but. I wanted to wrap this up on a serious note because this is actually a very serious topic. So uh, we will say this until we're blue in the face and Richard and I are not alone. We uh, as network defenders um, have got to normalize putting multi-factor authentication on everything. Until then, threat actors are not gonna improve their game. This is not limited to ITG-18. We see this across the board. Um, it really, um, we can't drive this point home enough to put it lightly. Um, two, although um, we took a light approach to some of this today, uh, ITG-18 is actually a very serious and prolific successful threat group that runs both espionage and surveillance, op surveillance operations. We've seen they have the ability to mass collect information, not just off personal webmail accounts, but also off of cell phones. Uh, they have hardly changed their tactics in the last four years yet they continue to expand their targets and operations. So this spring, for example, Richard and I observed um, them targeting Iranian citizens involved in the reformist movement that no doubt this was in line to, to monitor this party's activity around the recent Iranian presidential election that took place in June. And finally, uh, as network defenders, we need to think about how we train our employees to notice and report threats outside of our control. So in the case of ITG-18 and many other threat groups, personal resources are targeted and our employees' personal computing habits can impact the organizational security um, of our company. So if we think back to um, all the information that Richard covered that was stolen from one of the victims, where they were going on vacation, voice recordings, um, conversations with other people, that type of information is ripe for future social engineering operations. Anyway, on behalf of Richard and I, uh, we thank you guys so much for your time today and hope you learned a couple things.